Welcome to the Lazy CEO Podcast, where Jim Schlexer, author of Great CEOs Are Lazy and founder of the CEO Project, features compelling experts and topics for CEOs of mid to large size companies. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome, everybody, to the Lazy CEO Podcast. My name is Jim Schlexer. I'm your host and the founder of the CEO Project. Um, well, you know, podcasts are something that, um, you know, there's like 2 million of them at this point. And, uh, you know, the question is, is this a business tool? Like, and, and, you know, we all know about some of the big names that are out there that have done podcasts and they seem to make a lot of money on it. But is there a way for us as business people to engage with podcasts in a useful way? It seems like a compelling platform, but how do you maximize it? How do you optimize it? How do you turn it into something that can actually generate real business instead of being a hobby where we talk about, you know, the orchids of South America? So today we've got somebody who is super great at this and he's going to help us understand it and uh, maybe give you guys a couple of guys and gals, a couple of ideas about how to turn this into a profound tool for business growth. So Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your business with a podcast. He is the co-host of the Sharkpreneur podcast, which I've been lucky enough to be on, with Shark Tank's Kevin Harrington. And it was just named one of the top 10 podcasts to listen to in 2019, which I guess this happened a couple of years ago by NASDAQ. Uh, he is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination. It's kind of a cute and cuddly name that he picked for his company. <laughs> and he is a nine-time best-selling author who's been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes, CBS Money Watch, and many, many more. So, Seth, welcome. So glad you're here. Thank you so much. It is an honor to be here. It was fun having you on my podcast, so I can't wait to return the favor. Yeah, well, this will be great. I, I, you know, obviously we've engaged with a podcast um, and hoping it, it drives business. But what do you see... Um, you know, what kind of organizations does a podcast work as a way to outreach and let's say educate clients and, and maybe more like, let's say I'm doing a really good job. What can I expect from a podcast? So it, the magic answer to everything is it depends, right? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. We're done here. <laughs> yes. So short interview. So I think, so we are a little bit controversial in this space. We do not follow the normal methodology of why you should have a podcast which the majority of people of those 2 million, you know, there's, it's such a common stat in our industry. It's called pod fading, right? Where someone starts a podcast and quits after the, before the, the before they get to 10 episodes yeah. they quit because they had the wrong vision. They thought they were going to just start a podcast and talk and they were going to go viral, become Joe Rogan, make a million dollars and their business was going to take off. And that's not what, wait, happens. wait, wait, that's not what happens. It is not what happens. I'm oh. sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. So we believe that the podcast is the greatest networking tool ever invented. And if your podcast, if it's up to us, it's about the relationship you have with your guests and your guests audience. Mm. It's not that you're going to get a million consumer downloads and it's not that you're going to make all your money on sponsorship and ad revenue because right. most podcasts never get to the 10,000 downloads an episode that you would ever need to get real advertising revenue. Yep. You don't so have to be think, like a top 1%, half a percent yes. you know, to do that, right? Yeah. yeah and thankfully, um, we've been a, I've been able to pull that off, but that's not the norm. Yeah. So we believe that the podcast people you interview should be strategic. And when I invented our process for my own business, I said, huh, if I do 50 episodes in a year and 50 people, I get 50 downloads total, I'm happy. Wow. Because that means the person who listened to the show, who was on the show, then listened to their episode. Yep. And we believe they should have, you should, there are two different main people that we think you should interview on your podcast. One, end user clients, right? If you wanted to interview, and I'm using you as an example, if you were trying to recruit more CEOs to be part of the CEO project, you could interview the CEO following our format and then using our 82 step follow up process convert them into a member of the CEO project and get them in a group. Okay, 82 steps. You lost me at 82. 
Well, we we do all of the 82 steps for you, and we can uh, talk about what those 82 steps are in just a minute. However, it doesn't take 82 steps to work. On average, it takes four, and we'll get. To, I, we can talk about that if you want. The other type of person you should interview is a potential joint venture partner, yep. a potential affiliate. So, if you wanted to interview somebody else who's got a um, who's a CEO, wrote a book for CEOs, and they have 10,000 CEOs on their email list who have bought their book, you yep. would interview them, follow our process, and turn them into a affiliate where they were promoting your CEO project to their followers on a weekly basis so that every week your cash register was ringing with new leads and new members that came from their customer base, their following. So those are the right. two main types of people we suggest you could interview and if you follow the process we created, you have a very high conversion rate of either turning them into clients or turning them into referral partners. And we've driven $150 million in sales this way. So we know it works. Yep. Got it. So it's funny, you know, most people think the podcast is the product, but it's not. The podcast is the vehicle to get the relationship that drives the, the revenue. Yes. That's for really us, the we tell them it is the first public facing touch point between that starts the relationship between you and the guest and their audience. It is not the product in and of itself. We specifically tell them you're not going to go viral. You're not going to get a million downloads. And we honestly don't want you to because most of our clients are B2B and they're never going to achieve any mass consumer following because it wouldn't be right for them. And there probably aren't a million CEOs that are right for the CEO project. You want to cherry pick and maybe you just need to be micro famous to the right thousand or 10,000 people. Right. I mean, there aren't a, a million CEOs all in anyway. So right. yeah, right. It's much smaller market. Globally, it's not even a million. So um, that's that's really profound. Um, so once you identify, get them on the podcast, does it matter what the podcast content is? Or is it just a conversation? Because I tell you, I've had some people approach me and there's a methodology out there with like, we're going to ask seven questions. And we actually use this for a little while. Seven questions, really quick, blah, 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 just to get them on the podcast. They're super easy, low depth. You know, you're not going deep, right? Is that the model or is it like genuine conversation? Let's really probe and like, like we would if we sat down and chatted for 30, 40 minutes. So we have found the ideal length of time for a podcast is 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. Because most podcasts are consumed while multitasking. The average time on a treadmill is half an hour. The average commute is half an hour. Yeah. So, and those are the most popular times that people listen. Yep. And we found statistically that after 30 minutes, people you're, you, the people who are listening tend to drop off. We, we, we've seen exactly the same thing in our numbers. So I completely agree with that. Yeah. So unless you are so famous to your audience, like a Tony Robbins or a Tim Ferriss can have an hour to 90 minute show yep. and people will listen to it in chunks or they'll stay tuned the whole time. Most of us aren't that famous, aren't that lucky and our fans don't love us that much. So <laughs> 20, 30 minutes is enough. Yep. It's the ideal time to have a substantive conversation. No, it should not just be seven minutes rapid fire, you know, just to get them on. Yeah. That's, would you want to, would you rather, if you met, forgive the example, but if Sharon was, if you and Sharon were both single and Sharon is the girl of your dreams, do you want to spend seven minutes on a speed date? Or if she's willing to give you the time of day and give you a half an hour, would you rather have the half hour? Well, that, right? that would You'd be directionally correct if you were interested in the other party. Yes. <laughs> right. You would take as much time as they would possibly give you. You can never take too much time. So people ask us all the time, like in the marketing world, that people have nine second attention span. Shouldn't we write short posts, short copy? And I say, no, you can never be too long. You can only be too boring. Nah. Yep. If someone is passionately interested about what you're saying, they will read, yes, physically read as much content as you can stay interesting for. I've done eight hour webinars where people stayed on the entire time. Wow. We've sent sales letters that were 112 pages long and got more sales than we sent a four page sales letter. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. And I've I've heard the long copy strategy. So yeah, I, I, I've heard this before. It's most people don't have the um, the energy to build four, five, 10, 20 pages of interesting copy. That takes a lot of work to yes, really nail it. why our like copywriters that. are very busy. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, so let's say I go, okay, I get this. I'm going to try to find, you know, either acquisition partners or JV partners or just straight up clients, right? And I like, by the way, the um, affiliate partners. One of my, uh, I spoke with him before he passed away, um, Dave Thompson. He wrote a book called Blueprint to a Billion. I have that book. 
great book. On, he was on my podcast. Great, great guy. He's passed away, unfortunately. Yes. Um, but he had this concept of big brother partners. So he's like, you got to find one big relationship yeah. that brings you everywhere you can't get and da, da 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 What I like about your affiliate model is it's like the small brother strategy. I need 20 affiliate partners that are going to do work in various chunks. And that's how I get home, which you I think it, which feels right. easier to me. It feels easier. And you can shoot for the moon and you can get that dream relationship. That one person who could change your business, change your life. I've done it with Kevin from Shark Tank, my co-host. And I've done it other times because once you have some traction, you'd be amazed at who you can get in the door with. Yep. But the, that's not your bread and butter. Your bread and butter is someone maybe a tier or a couple tiers ahead of where you are. Maybe it's someone who's where you want to be. Right. And they can help pull you up and get you there. And if you had even half of the 50 episodes in 50 weeks do that for you, you won't recognize your business in a year. Yep. Awesome. So what what happens before the show and what happens after the show to make this successful? So before the show, there's a whole lot of, so you've got to, the most important part before the show is the research is finding the right person yep. who can move the needle for you in one of those two ways, then getting them prepared to be a good guest. You'd be amazed in this day and age, people still don't realize, Hey, wait, I'm supposed to turn my camera on. This is on video. I'm not camera ready. I st I've had people we, before um, we used to, you know, in code during COVID people would show up in their t-shirts and yeah. I had somebody running a seven multi seven figure company the other day, show up for his interview in a t-shirt. And I'm like, that's really how you want to show up. Um, but people still do it. So yeah. one prepping them ahead of time. And then the, I think the mo most important part on the back end is the follow-up that gets them excited to talk to you again, because the podcast in our opinion should be all about your guests. It's yep. literally, they do 80% of the talking, you do 20%, you're shining a, a spotlight, however big or small it is, on them, getting making them look good. The more you make them look good, the more they will know, like, and trust you, mm -hmm. right? Jay Abraham told me a story the other day how he was on a flight and he decided, fine, he had a chatty per next to him, decided he'd talk to the person next to him and just make a game out of it. Three hour flight, Jay asked questions the entire time. The guy never asked him a question. By the time they landed, it, when they landed, the guy turns to Jay and says, you're the best conversationalist, most interesting person I've ever met. And Jay's like, yeah. he, didn't, he didn't learn one thing about me. Yeah. But apparently I'm interesting because I was interested. Yeah. Well, he took, he stole that from Dale Carnegie, right? Yes, he did. Uh, and he yeah, turned so, that But that's okay. He's he stealing from a good client, one. So it worked. Yeah. Oh, did he turn into a client, that guy? Yeah. Nice. Good for him. Um, so you yeah, want no, to be you have to be interested in the other person. And then the follow-up that gets them from podcast guests to, I want to learn more about you. I want to help you. I want to get spread the word about what you're doing is what really will make your cash register ring. Got it. Interesting. So, all right. So I get research, prep them somewhere between job interview and beach party, but <laughs> right, maybe closer to job interview. We do the, the sort of 30 minutes of highly interested 80-20 conversation and then what, what's the hook now I reach out afterwards. Like, what does it look like? What is the 80? Let's start with the first four really effective steps of the 82 step. We don't have to go yep. through them all, but we won't how do you engage? Um, a week after the podcast airs, we send those of you watching on video can see this. This is what we call our magic tumbler. Yeah. It's like a Yeti. It's magic because of the art that's on it. So this is the art from the podcast. And in this case, Ross is our client. He's the podcast host. Joelle is the micro influencer who he wants a relationship with, who he interviewed. This goes through us from Ross to Joelle. She doesn't know what's coming. Yep. It's a big box in the mail. She opens it. She's super excited. She says, oh my God, this is so cool. Now when it's got her picture on it and Ross's picture. So when she drinks her coffee all day, every day, she stares at our client's face. Yep. Very, very uh, hard to throw that out, right? Yes. It is not just <laughs> top of mind. It's top of desk. Yep. And she will look at it all day, every day. It's not just a t-shirt she might wear once and uses a rag, right? Right. It's going to stick around. And then we send them a postcard in the mail every month. We send them a small gift in the mail every month. So think book, journal, box of chocolates, bag of popcorn, something clever, thoughtful, warm and fuzzy that doesn't cost too much so they don't feel bribed. Right. And we know by the time they've gotten a tumbler, a car, a tumbler, a card, a gift, um, and an email saying from our podcast producer saying, Hey, Joel, 
Ross wanted me to know he had a great idea based on something you said during your interview and wanted to set up another time to talk to you to share it with you. It's not a sales pitch. Of, you know, we don't have anything to sell you. It'll take you 10, 15 minutes to have that conversation. Are you open to having another chat with Ross? Nine times out of 10, she says, yes. Sure. And then Ross follows our script on that call and converts over 80% of those people into affiliates, joint venture partners, or clients. Wow. That's spectacular. That's spectacular. Now you have a, a third party that does the fulfillment for all this, right? We do all the, we do all the manual labor for our clients. Yes. What? So you got so, a screen, you got a screen printer out in the back and you're doing coffee mugs. Really? You don't have a third party who can do that. Okay. So we, yes and no. So yes, we have a fulfillment house, but yeah. we are coordinating, customizing the graphics and doing all of the work so that the right thing goes to the right person at the right time. Right. And the client doesn't have to deal with it. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. They don't touch it. It's good. Now, are there, I, I saw, you know, looking at some of your background, there are particular fields that you have focused on, financial services, marketing agencies, which is funny that you're doing marketing for marketing agencies, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so what, what kind of businesses does this work best for? Great question. Yes. Um, so we're in three different verticals. We're in professional practices, which would be financial advisors, marketing, accountants, lawyers, doctors. Think white collar, high ticket. Yep. Um, we're in the information marketer space, people selling courses or membership sites online. And then e-commerce, people selling physical products direct to consumer. Mm. The caveat is they've either got to be high ticket. Yep. Right. If you're selling a tent, the, you know, I'm in Buffalo, New York, the pizza and wing place down the street for me wouldn't be a good prospect. Yeah, right? Def define, define high ticket, Seth. I'm getting there. So okay. they might be $20, $30 average sale of a pizza. No not way. a good, they're not going to get an ROI. They'd have to sell too many pizzas. It wouldn't work. Um, high ticket. So I'm thinking either recurring revenue every month of 500 to a thousand bucks or a lot more, or like our estate planners, our financial advisors, they might make 10, 15, 20 grand a client. Yep. And then information marketers, it's the same thing. But if they have like a course where it's, you could do one where it's like a couple hundred bucks a month to be in the course because we can get you leverage in a whole lot of people. Yep. The e-commerce side, again, it depends on the price of the product. We have one, our lowest ticket one right now is a sneaker manufacturer. Their sneakers are about 150 bucks. Wow. But we have such volume, like their influencers, those people might have an email list of half a million consumers so while they don't have a high ticket product, we can make it up in volume. Okay, got it. And so there they would not focus on clients, they'd focus on affiliates. Correct, because they're right. not trying to sell one, one pair of shoes at a time and they'd go broke. They yeah. need someone who can email out or post on social media and generate 500 or 1,000 sales with the push of a button. Boy, I probably have, a, I have somebody I need to talk to you about who has specialty uh, footwear actually for cheer and from some up for some other uh, oh my daughter is a cheerleader so i would love to learn May I, there oh, you got a sale she'll she'll know the name i'll get it okay. to you later yeah okay good there you go we we want a fan it's your daughter but okay <laughs> maybe she'll become a ceo someday um so that's good does it what about on retention right i've built the relationship i they said yes and I've got to retain and maintain the relationship. How do I think about that? Or do you sort of say, hey, we got you the guy or gal, we're done. How does- No, so, so that's part of the, that's why it's an 82 step follow-up sequence. Ah. Because they are going to get a postcard every month. They are going to get another gift every month. They are going to get a print magazine every other month. They are going to get an email specifically for them about the relationship every single week that we write. So mm. we are in front of them both physically and virtually all the time on behalf of our clients. So we do all the nurturing for them Got so it. that they are, that person is going, Oh my God. Like literally we get um, an email emails every day. Our clients get emails every day going, Oh my God, Dr. Jim, it's like your new, my, my new best friend. I can't believe all the stuff you send me. This is fantastic. What else can I do for you? Yeah. Love it. That's right. We so took you... the goodwill and reciprocity from Cialdini's influence book and said, how do we put that on steroids? Yeah, no, well, there's a good theory, which is called, um, uh, well, it's a law of reciprocity, right? Yeah, so what you, you, you created the obligation on the other side with this model <clears throat> really elegantly. That's great. Um, so what, what do we do if we're trying to do a podcast and we're trying to use it to engage, what do we do that screws us up? Like, what are the mistakes that you see people making that go, yeah, that was not ever going to work. That was a really bad idea. What, what would be the three, five things that we go? The absolute Seth Green's no-no list, right? <laughs> um, number one, quitting too soon. All right. Um, so the the fade thing, don't yeah, fade. Number two, wrong strategy to begin with. 
Yep. Um, thinking I'm just going to go make a bunch of money and get, go viral and get downloads and sponsorships. Number three, um, doing it, you're doing it by yourself, doing it with, where, where you are the host and it's a rant show. You're the only one who talks, right? It's so funny. I had this experience with the wrestler Stone Cold Steve Austin who said, no, man, you don't understand. I got like 30 years of wrestling stories on the road. I could, I could do talk for hours and hours and hours and hours. I'm doing it myself and telling stories. And I said, it's really hard to be interesting by yourself. <laughs> At least have somebody talk to you. No, no, no. I got this, man. I got this. You don't understand. Like, okay. It's your show. So he starts doing shows. 10 minutes in silence. <laughs> like, Steve, what happened? He's like, you're right. I was like, what happened to the hours and hours and decades of stories? He's like, it's hard to just talk by yourself and come up with stuff without someone to play with. I'm yeah. Like, Right. And you just wanted to do it because you're a celebrity. The normal business owner don't. Can you add solo episodes if you want to teach something, educate, talk about your business for absolutely. However, it should all be about the guest and either what that guest can ultimately do with me or what they can do for me. And how do I build that relationship? So going at it with the wrong goal in mind from the beginning, you'll end up pod fading and quitting because Anything else probably won't work unless you want to spend millions of dollars on ad budget or you've got a Netflix comedy special. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not yet. I'm working on it. Um, yeah, so I just read this book. The audience is listening. A little guide to building a big podcast by Tom Lester. I don't know that one. I'm going to go get it. Go get it. Uh, Tom is uh, with Edison Research and sort of a, a early, early podcast oh, yeah. podcast researcher and understander of uh, of the space. He wrote this book. He talks a lot about understanding the audience and making sure that you're, this is going to sound super obvious, say something your audience actually wants to listen to. Not what you want to hear, what yeah. they want to hear, which obvious. But the other one, just to your two people thing, he said most radio t shows have three roles, uh, a, a dork, a dick, and a deer, right? Keep so it clean, you know, keep it clean. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm sorry. That was He's what the quoting. Book I'm quoting air quotes around that. Yeah. Um, so think about Howard Stern, right? Howard is the yes, the, the DK and the, the dork was stump, mutter, stuttering John or one of the other characters. Right. And Robin was the deer. She laughed and was lovely and wonderful. And the that, normal person that triad works apparently as a model for a show um, for decades on radio. He was it actually does, but I'm going to pivot on that because. Yeah, that works when it's the three of them with each other and notice they aren't, it's just a talk show. People are listening to them to hear what they say because of their virtual relationship with who those people are. That, if you want to build a personality following, that's a whole separate business model. It's going to take you a whole lot longer and cost a ton of ad revenue, a right. ton of ad money to get that out to the world. That's the whole, I'm going to be so interesting and funny that I'm going to go viral. Yep. Whereas your business owners, your CEOs, you don't need three people. You don't need those roles. You need the host whose role is to be the reporter, the journalist, to the fascinating person to interview other people. Yep. And then the people are tuning in to listen, are tuning in to listen to hear about that guest. Right. He's promote like Bob is promoting it to his audience and they're tuning in to learn about Bob. Like when I promote this, people will tune in to learn, whereas your it's not about you. It's about which is hard for a lot of people to get over. The show isn't about you. It's about the of uh, the way we do it. It's about the other person. Well, it depends on your objective. Right. You want the ego stroke, then have fun. Right. If right. you want to grow you'll your quit business in 10 to episodes and you'll waste a bunch of time and money. <laughs> So when these people that show up with like, I'm a, I'm a top 5%, a top 10%, a top 2.5% podcast, like they're, it's the wrong metric. It should yeah, be, I, I, I added 10 affiliate partners last year. Yes. Downloads are for vanity. Profits are for sanity. Nah, so, oh, I may steal that. <laughs> you're more than welcome to. Um, it's funny. I modified it. I stole it from Robin Robbins who said top line is vanity. Profits are sanity. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, we do, uh, we do revenues for show and puttons for dough, right? There you go. But, yes. Yeah. Profits for dough. Excuse me. Profits yeah, for dough. I like that yeah. one. So yes, it's all about what relationships did I get? And then when I've been doing it long enough for those relationships to turn into revenue or profits, it's how much money did I make from my show this week? How many leads did I get? How many appointments, how many sales, et cetera. And, and what, what do those metrics look like? I mean, when somebody's doing a pretty good job at this and they're consistent, you know, one year, two year, three years in of consistently executing the model, what kind of impact can they have on their business? 
And it depends on the business they had when they were starting with. Like, like I said, at the beginning, we've driven 150 million in sales and climbing from this for our clients. I would say, I mean, right. If you're, I mean, we've got clients who have generated seven figures in revenue a year or more from it. Is that wow. going to be everybody? No. Um, if you're doing a hundred million dollar company, there's an extra million matter to you. No, but you would have a bigger impact on a bigger company because your potential is larger, right? Yep. When I, the, the very first person I did this for other than me to prove that it would work for someone who wasn't me was a golf coach in Western New York mm. where, you know, six months out of the year, it's snowing. So he's not coaching anybody. <laughs> and we took him from, you know, making $75 a lesson, you know, six months out of the, however many months out of the year, the golf season is here to getting paid $50,000 per client, quitting his job at the country club and building a, um, I think he's multiple six figure. Like he used to come to my in-person seminars every month, then quit because he was making so much money. And he, part of the program was CEOs would fly him to their home course to do three days with him on their course. And every other week he's like, I'm in the Caribbean. I'm in, I'm at St. Andrews. I'm at where I'm at Augusta. Um, I'm like, well, that's why you can't come to our local meetup mass, you know, seminars because <laughs> you're living the dream. And he's like, I make more in one month than I used to do all year. Wow. That is spe- what a success it story. Was off of a golf CEO podcast. I said, who's your dream client? If, if I had a magic wand and he said, man, I'd love to get coach some of those celebrity CEOs who play in the charity golf tournaments. And I said, well, I don't know if I can get you fortune 500 CEOs, but I can get you Inc 500. Yep right? Who are more reachable. And he's like, I don't believe it, but whatever. He took the leap of faith. And literally we created the last golf lesson ever, which was like a three day, six, whatever program. And he's like, I can't sell this for $50,000. I said, yes, you can. Your ability to generate higher fees is proportional to your ability to keep a straight face when you quote the price. (laughs) So I Uh, said, trust me, worst case, first person says a couple people say, no, no one's going to know that they said no. Right. The phone, you would not believe, like literally, I think he was jumping up and down the first phone call I got of this guy just said yes, and he's sending me a check for 50 grand. Wow, that is spectacular. Um, Just jumping over to affiliate partners, and we'll probably start wrapping up on this. Um, Who are the ideal affiliate partners? When I'm thinking about who should I bring on, I get clients, hopefully you're clear on your client base, but then I want an affiliate marketer, somebody who's going to build other relations, influence and build other, who are they? What do they look like? Give me, and maybe give me some typical examples would be good. Sure. So it's going to depend on who your clients are. You want to go backwards and think not who's my competition, but who is my co-opetition? Yep. Who else serves the same people I do, but doesn't compete with me? So mm-hmm. in that example, so a financial advisor wants referrals usually from accountants and lawyers. Yep. Be the same affluent baby boomer people, right? Um, I started my career as a, and I still own that business, as a college financial aid negotiator. My ideal referral sources were financial advisors, but more importantly, were high school guidance counselors who see all the kids. So we now literally have a couple thousand high school guidance counselors who promote that business all the time. Wow. So you just have to think backwards and go, who else serves the same people but doesn't do what I do? Who could, has a, has a large client base of them and who could move the needle for me? Nice. Okay. Got it. So just nose count, right? You, you have a thousand interesting clients that in my space, let's talk. Yes. Yep. Very cool. Awesome. Um, Seth, this was great. What didn't I ask that I should have asked? Well, I, as I said, we could sit here for three hours. And uh, I know. I know. This, but we got 30. We're, we're almost out of time. Um, am I allowed? We have a gift for your listeners. Am I allowed to give that away? Tell you what it is? Have that as long as I can figure out a way to get one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But go yeah. ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely can. So um, I wrote the Amazon bestselling book, The Ultimate Guide to Growing Your Business with a Podcast, How to Turn Warm Fuzzy Feelings into Cold Hard Cash. If we have a link for your listeners. So if you want, if you go to ultimatepodcastbook.com, they can get it at, I think it's like 30, 40% off the Amazon price if they want a hard copy. And if they want the a digital download, a free digital download of the book, I'll get you the link to put in the show notes because that URL is longer. Yep. Well, we will definitely put it in the show notes and uh, hopefully flood you with uh, with opportunities here. So <laughs> that's awesome. great. Your lips to God's ears. Thank you. Yeah. And if people wanted to talk to you about this, I mean, clearly super knowledgeable I got to imagine some people are going to want to talk to you. How would they get a hold of you? How would they find you? Um, our website's marketdominationllc.com. 
Uh, my email address is slightly different. It's Seth at marketdominationprogram.com. Um, and the social media network I'm on the most often is LinkedIn. Um, so email LinkedIn me or go to our website and fill out the form. Awesome. And any way you'd like to get a hold of Seth, you can find him. Yes. Um, it's so funny. My kids were having uh, one of my daughters and her friend were like, one day we're just like, let's Google ourselves and see what we can find. Uh, yeah. The and vanity search. Yeah. The neighbor's <laughs> kid like found zero doesn't exist. And we, my daughter, we've built her a website. We published several books, children's books for her. Like she's been on my wife's podcast like half a dozen times. So she Googles herself and there's page after page after yeah. page of her. And her friend is like, you're famous. And she's like, well, not really, but. <laughs> That sounds like a college application to me. I have done, yes. To, I, I have a son who is a high school senior and who is doing the applications right now. And yes, you should see his resume. It's not all thanks to me, but. Nice. And um, maybe last question. What do you do for fun, Seth? Um, I am a lifelong martial artist. I, I'm a second degree black belt in Krav Maga. I am a professional magician. I play piano guitar and I try and keep up with my kids. If you don't like Seth's magic trick, don't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. You might get punched in the nose. I'll, well, hey, Seth, this was phenomenal. Just a lot of fun and tremendous knowledge transfer and a lot of value added. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. Absolutely. We'll see you next time on the Lazy CEO Podcast. Thanks for joining us. This podcast is brought to you by The CEO Project. At the CEO Project, we work with CEOs to help them grow their business. Uh, and our members represent billions of dollars of revenue and profit. And frankly, amongst all of us, we've probably made every mistake in the book, including some you haven't made yet. So if you want to learn from the experience of a bunch of really seasoned CEOs, we're a great place to hang out. In this podcast, what you're going to hear are some of those ideas, concepts, and things that are just going to help you on your journey. If you want to find out more, reach out to us at theceoproject.com or you can contact me personally at jim at theceoproject.com. Happy listening. Thanks for listening to the Lazy CEO Podcast. We'll see you next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes and check out our website, www.theceoproject.com.